Let me uh, just uh, begin now by saying uh, a word about uh, you as a leadership community, something about myself and something about these, um, these materials um, and, and their development. Um, there's a little bit of confusion about what leadership community is. When we send out the invitations, you know, to everybody, we always get, you know, probably half a dozen or so back saying, I'm not a small group leader. Why are you, why are you inviting me to this? Well, remember, this is not small group community. This is leadership community, and that's uh, stated that way for a purpose. Uh, whether you are a past leader, a current leader, future leader, uh, if you're a serving team leader, if you are a ministry team leader on a ministry, a leadership team in any ministry, um, leadership is really influence. And so if you're here, it's because we think you have influence. You exert influence in your circles, uh, be they, you know, micro circles or even little bigger circles. And uh, so we want you to have the opportunity, at least, to, to get behind the scenes, to know what's going on, uh, to kind of get the backstory and to get some training because you're the folks who are most vulnerable to getting burned out and we don't want that to happen so we want to uh, make sure that we're you know kind of you know giving some stuff to you that's going to encourage you inspire you envision you so uh, understand uh, when you when you get that that this is what leadership community is I used to actually start every leadership community with this quote from John Cotter who is a uh, professor at Harvard Business School he said the key to creating and sustaining successful 21st century organization is leadership. Not only at the top of the hierarchy with a capital L, in other words, the senior leadership, but also in the more modest sense, little l, throughout the enterprise. So the little L's are the small group leaders, the serving team leaders, mission team leaders. Um, and if you think about it, it is exactly what Jethro said to Moses. Uh, Jethro was concerned. He saw Moses trying to you know, deal with the whole nation of Israel. And he said, what you need to do, uh, he's you know, sometimes called the first consultant in the Bible. Uh, he says to uh, his son-in-law, Moses, you're going to kill yourself. What you need to do is to divide up Israel into thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. Now, if you think about it, what's he doing? He's decentralizing you know, the, the oversight and the influence uh, throughout the nation of Israel, even down to ten. Uh, and so it's a very effective uh, uh, you know, way of dealing with a large group of people. So uh, you are those people, you are those little L's that are exerting tremendous influence. And so uh, I, I appreciate you coming and I appreciate the opportunity uh, just to expose you to this material. Let me, let me say a word about myself here. I'm, I'm hitting, I'm at this season of life where I'm hitting all these milestones. Uh, a year ago yesterday I turned 70, which is a big milestone. Now that means I turned 71 yesterday. <laughs> Just checking your math, okay. So, uh, in December, Karen and I went on our 50 year anniversary uh, trip and celebrated 50 years of marriage. And next summer, I will celebrate 50 years of being in ministry. So, you know, I, I, I have all these, and of course, everybody is playing the whole, <laughs> send your gift cards, and yeah, that'll be fine. Um, and, you know, so as, as uh, each passing year goes by, uh, you know, the, the elders are, are kind of monitoring my aging process. And, you know, they, they, they've said things to me like this. They said, you know, you've got a lot of this stuff about discipleship rattling around in your head up there. And, uh, you know, you could just drop dead tomorrow, you know. So <laughs> would, would, you, would you write this down, you know, so we would have it. So, so that's why you have this stuff here, okay. It was a response to a... It, it, yeah, that was pretty much what they said. So, so this is your going away <laughs> So... Um, what you have before you uh, in, in terms of the cultivating uh, uh, disciple-making culture uh, is really my attempt to kind of codify and to get down on paper these key ideas and best practices in disciple-making. I don't want you to think of it as a book. It's not that. And it's not even cliff notes. It's really more like uh, minutes of a meeting. When you get the minutes of a meeting, the idea is that you've been to a presentation um, and they just summarize the key ideas, you know, the minutes of the meeting, so that you can go back as a kind of a reference point. So think of it like that. We're not going to cover it all, uh, but we are going to get a good introduction into it, and then we're going to carry on this conversation for the next year. So uh, when you go out of here, don't be discouraged because we haven't explained everything. There's a lot of 
explanation, a lot of application, a lot of illustration that could go with uh, you know, each little section in here. But uh, uh, I, I want you to understand what you have there, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about how it developed. First off, I developed section two, which is the leadership guide. So if you just you know, thumb through it, you'll see a section two, it says leadership guide. That was actually originally the, the assignment from the elders, and uh, it, it was to kind of get this stuff down on paper. And once I finished that, I sent it around to a couple friends um, and asked them for their feedback. And uh, one of my out-of-town friends who knows me very well said, he said, you know, he said, you, you're a teacher. You like to teach, you like to explain things. And he said, that, that comes through here. He said, but you have to remember that most people aren't looking for an explanation. They're looking for inspiration. <laughs> Um, and, and uh, you know, as, as he said it, you know, he, he went on to say, you know, he said, people don't, mo he said, most people don't want to go into the kitchen and see how the sausage is made. They just want a sausage sandwich. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's, that's really true. And um, so that sort of provoked a discussion, Adam, John Sicker, and myself, that, you know, we should have a two-pronged strategy of not only a leadership that was more for leaders to give them the background and the explanation and so forth, but we needed something that was real simple, uh, real short and concise, and so that's the section that we now put first, which is the uh, congregation guide. We, we, we wanted to say, okay, how do we take the theory and, and the best practices and these key insights and make them actionable in the life of a congregation. So that's what's going on there in the, in the congregation guide. And then the deployment strategy is simply uh, a calendar that you can uh, see the key dates and the flow of ministry and so forth. Uh, let, let me just kind of shift now from that, that kind of brief introduction uh, to uh, uh, the why we're doing this. You know, Simon Sinek has a famous TED talk called, you know, why. He said, you always want to push everything back to the why. And uh, I had a very interesting um, encounter with uh, Mark Hall. He's fine with me share sharing this. I actually had breakfast with him today and we were kind of joking about this. But um, uh, he asked me several months ago, actually it was kind of late spring, really just getting into the summer, and he said, hey, he said, do you have any resources on the race issue? He said, I really, our group would really like to get into this race issue. Now, I knew that we were already planning for the integrated series, but, um, you know, so I, I, I tried to say as gently as possible, hey, you know, we're going to do this integrated series, it's going to be really great, so I really want you to, you know, kind of join, join with us on this one. And he's the gracious guy he is. He says, oh, yeah, sure. He said, but, you know, keep your, keep your radar up, and if you see something. So uh, anyway, as I went away from that conversation, I, I, I thought that was a lame uh, response to a great question. In other words, the burning issue of our day is racism, and, you know, you, you know you, oh, you're going to do an integrated series. Great. Okay. So, you know, I, I began to think, okay, what would be a better response to that? And uh, I, I went to the summit, um, I, I watched it at home, I went to the summit at home. And uh, it's a leadership conference, I've been going to it for years. And uh, how many of you remember uh, Alan Funt, the guy that developed Candid Camera? His daughter is Juliet Funt. But actually she shared this thing called laddering up. And, and laddering up, she said, is, is when you keep taking steps up the ladder to get back to the why. Because she said it's the why that motivates, it's the why that empowers people. So, you know, when you give answers or give responses, you know, you always want to be able to tell why. So I began to apply this, and this is how it uh, came out. Uh, a better response to Mark's question. Uh, well, we're doing uh, an integrated series. Well, why are you doing an integrated series? Well, because we want to drill down on discipleship. Well, why do you want to drill down on discipleship? Well, because we want to make more and better disciples. Well, why do you want to make more and better disciples? Well, because Jesus' last words were about making disciples. He said it was the most important thing. Well, why did Jesus say it was the most important thing? Because he came to restore the world. Well, why did Jesus come to restore the world? Because he wanted the, the, the world to bring, he wanted to bring peace into the world. He wanted to address race issues and lots of other things. Now, you see what just happened there? So I ran that by Mark. And he said, oh, yeah, I want to do this. Let's see. So understand why and, 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 and why now. Um, here's a Dallas Willard quote um, I want you to see, and you have to always think about Dallas Willard. You can't just read him, you have to stop and think. 
He says, widespread transformation of character through wise discipleship to Christ can transform our world. It can disarm the structural evils that have always dominated humankind and now threaten to destroy the world. Now, notice what he says the threat is. Structural evils, like racism, uh, that threaten to destroy the world. And you can see that. When you look at what's happening in our cities now, you can say, yeah, you can see it. Um, and, and what does he say is the, uh, the need? Well, it's for widespread transformation of character. In other words, if there was a, a widespread transformation of character, that would go a long ways toward mitigating the issues that we have going on in the country. And, then, and so the solution is wise discipleship to Christ. Now let that sink in for just a second. Because this doesn't happen very often, where, where people actually press the problems that we're having in our society back to, you know, back to spiritual things. In fact, one of the things I found most interesting, talking to Mark today, uh, they, they actually went ahead, they met over the summer, and they, they did the study on racism. And he said, you know, he said, I, I didn't agree with everything in the book, he said, but there was some, some fascinating insights. He said, one that really troubled me was that there were 4,000 Klansmen who were preachers. Think about that. Now, you know, if there was real deep transformation, <laughs> those 4,000 preachers would have been using their influence in polar opposite ways. So you, you begin to see how much of what goes on and what's going wrong in our world right now can be traced back to really a lack of discipleship. And who's responsible for discipleship? The church, exactly. In fact, let me give you kind of a, a quick summary here of how Dallas Willard would, would uh, probably present it. First of all, the church exists to make disciples. I don't know if you remember it, but I, I've used the C.S. Lewis quote before when I try and make that point. It's right in our NCC mission statement. We exist to make disciples. And it's not just NCC, it's what the Church of Christ exists for. So the church exists to make disciples. Secondly, disciples are God's delivery system to bless the world. You know, that, that runs all through the scripture. Uh, Archbishop William Temple, an Anglican, said this. He said, the, uh, he said the church is the only organization in the world that exists for its non-members. Now thirdly, his plan was to release Christ-like people into every domain of the world. In other words, if, you, if the church were actually transforming people, if they were becoming more and more Christ-like, um, and, and they were then going out into every domain of society, government, politics, media, arts, entertainment, business, healthcare, education. If they were transformed and became more and more like Christ, what would they be like? What, just, let's just make a quick list. What would Christ's likeness look like? Well, Other hence our problem, you see? Other-centered. <laughs> Other centered, okay. Yeah, Jesus was a man for others. Love, yeah, he was loving, self-giving, good biblical definition for love. Self-giving, other-centered, what else? Compassion. Compassion. S Servant-oriented. Servant-oriented. Looking out for other people. Now, if you, th you see if the people in politics, people in the media, were thinking of the other people, if they were passionate, you know, would you have the kind of uh, hostility and vitriol that's going back and forth? No. Um, by the way, uh, you do realize that Somewhere estimates run between a fourth and a third of the people in the United States are professing Christians. Okay. But how many of those are practicing Christians? By the way, is there such a thing as a non-practicing Christian? No, not according to the Bible. In other words, that's what a Christian is. It's a disciple. It's someone who's following Christ. Okay. Now, you know, take, those, take, take moral courage, for instance sadly lacking in our day. You know, people watch all kinds of evil going on around them and don't even raise a finger. People who are professing Christians, see? So, but moral, so moral courage is not just about compassion and love and other sinning. It's also about moral courage. It's about people having the guts to stand up to evil. And yet you rare, rarely see that today. Is that what Jesus did? He stood up to the evil, you know, um, establishment around him. Um, he, but at the same time, he was wise, he was winsome, you know, he, he was, uh, I mean, he could, he could talk harsh to people, but he could 
also be compassionate to those who needed it. Well, you could make a pretty good list of, uh, you know, people that uh, uh, were, are becoming Christ-like, moral courage, wise, winsome, self-giving, other-centered. Uh, co- how about colorblind, <laughs> you know? Um, colorblind, respectful of other people. Remember the um, encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman? And Jesus is basically colorblind to her Samaritan ethnic background. He treats her as one made in the image of God. Think what difference that would make, you know, if people looked at each other that way. Um, so if the church exists to make disciples, and discipleship are God's delivery system to bless the world, his plan to release Christ-like people into every domain of the world, then true discipleship is the divine conspiracy to change the world. If you've ever heard that term before, it was a book titled by uh, Dallas Willard. The divine conspiracy, and that's what it means. Uh, the divine conspiracy was, you know, that, that, that God would change the world through people. Maybe you've heard E.M. Bounds' great line. He said, uh, you know, men are looking for better methods. God's looking for better men, better women. People who are Christ-like, who are so transformed by him uh, that they exercise moral courage. They exercise other-centeredness. They exercise love. Uh, and he says that's ultimately what's going to change the world. Well, that's the why. Uh, so I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that speaks to you. I hope that motivates you. I hope it empowers you. Okay, let's just go on to, uh, to the how. Okay, what I want to do is basically outline for you what's going to happen in the fall and then even going forward into the rest of the ministry year. Labor Day weekend, we'll either end the current series or do a, do a special Um, Then the 13th and the 20th, we're going to do a two-week series called Living Our Mission. And uh, the idea here is uh, uh, that, you know, organizations go through these exercises of defining their mission, their vision, their values, and then it ends up in a file somewhere. If you're lucky, it gets on a plaque on the wall. So what this year, here's the way I want you to think about this year. Uh, This year, we're going to get it off the wall and into the hall. Now, it's not like we haven't been doing that to some extent. We have. I, I've told the elders, I, you know, my, uh, my sense of the thing is that we are kind of in the red zone. So in football, you know, you march 80, down, 80, year, 80 yards down the field. You're, you're, you're inside the 20, but things get a little bit harder inside the 20 because you've got a compressed field to work with. And, uh, uh, but it doesn't count if you don't score. Okay, so I've made some lists of here's what I think we need to do if we're going to score, if we're going to actually put it in the end zone. But I think we are in a tipping point. And so that, that's why what we're doing this year is so incredibly important. Um, we want to we get the, the mission off of the wall into the hall in a much more robust way, in a much more intentional way than we have so far. Not to diminish anything we've done because we've done some good things. But as I tell Mark all the time, we're the tallest midget. Um, so, this two-part uh, mission could be summarized with three words that sort of shape what we're going to do. We want to, number one, inspire, we want to, number two, engage, and we want to, number three, consult. Now, I want to just kind of walk through those so you understand. You'll, under, you'll hear that word, inspire, from my friend's message. You know, you've you got to realize you're uh, an explainer, and people need to be inspired. So how do you inspire people? If you wanted someone to come to your new restaurant, if you wanted someone to try your new dish, what's the most effective way to do that? Yeah, invite them to do it to what? Person to person talk. I'm sorry, I can't hear you with a person to person talk. Okay, yeah, person to person talk. Yeah, personal endorsement. You know, personal raving fan. You know, I had the greatest. Actually, my, 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 my daughter said this. She said, I had the best chicken sandwich in my life. It's stacked. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, that's what makes you think, hmm, I wonder which one she, she had. I, I should try that. So, um, you know, what we're going to do in those first two weeks is we're going to have some media presentations. You, you got earlier in the mail uh, something that, uh, uh, you know, invited you. In fact, I think it was yesterday's uh, psalm that said, uh, talked about let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Or uh, I, the, the translation I was reading was really good too because it said uh, let the let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Okay, now that means you, if you're a practicing Christian, you need to be telling your story. As I look around here and see small group leaders, elders, 
pastors, <laughs> you know, you should be at the front of the line. You should be knocking down uh, Vicky's door saying, I want to tell my story. I want to tell, you know, what God's done in my life. So we're going to, you know, do a couple of different ones like this. But, you know, it could be as simple as this. My discipleship journey started when I walked in, and this is what happened. My discipleship journey was catalyzed when I got in this group of guys, and my life's never been quite the same since. So you got to do it, but just bang, bang, bang. So we're going to run some of those through those two weeks. We're going to have some live interviews. Um, we're going to do some of those things that cause people to, to go, hmm, I think I want to check this out. So we want to inspire them, first of all. I'm going to use some of the information that you're going to be exposed to tonight uh, to try to do that. But then we're going to engage them, okay? If you get inspired, now you, now you want to get engaged, right? And uh, here's what we're going to use to engage people. It's called The Four Chairs of Disciple Making. It comes from a book called Four Chair Discipling uh, by Dan Spader. And uh, it's got a, a very uh, interesting track record. But you can kind of see why I like it. It's very simple. It's very visual. It's very memorable. Um, notice the uh, language if you can read underneath it, or, or you can see it in your, on your handouts there. Uh, come and see. Yes, come and see. Come and follow. Come and be with me. R remain in me. Um, that, there, there's, there actually is a very discernible um, sequencing of Jesus in his training of the twelve. You know, at, at the very beginning of the Gospels, he, he's saying, you know, come and see, come and see. Remember Andrew, he says, come and see, you know. Um, and then there's this come, and, and so that's more of an invitation to a, to a seeker. It's, a, it's an invitation uh, to investigate, to explore. Um, then uh, come and follow me is more an invitation to learn, but it's not an invitation to learn to be learned, it's to, be, it's to learn to be like Christ. In other words, to, to be a servant, to be other-centered, to be self-giving. Um, and then come and uh, be with me is an invitation to be equipped. And the last one, uh, remain in me, is an invitation to multiply. Now, what, what I want you to see here are some of the subtle lessons that you can draw from this. First of all, what often happens in Disciple-making is, number one, we narrow it. The cultural understanding of discipleship is that it's, uh, you know, having a deep Bible study and getting into deep, you know, theological and biblical truth. Uh, that's not really the, the, the idea of the Bible, of disciple-making. In fact, I, you probably pick up that I use the term disciple-making as opposed to discipleship. Jesus never said, go do disciple, discipleship. He said, go make disciples. Making disciples is a developmental process. It's a sequence that starts with nine Christians. So when he says go, you know, make disciples of all nations, what is he talking about? Evangelism. He's saying part of the disciple making process is to win people who are far from Christ and to help bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. But, you know, we've made the, you know, the starting line, the finish line. <laughs> it's, it's like then we kind of abandon them and they just, you know, you never know what exactly. I used to get these letters all these times from, you know, Christian workers saying, you know, 150 people made decisions for Christ. And I'm wondering, what did they decide? There's no change in their life. There's no, there's nothing. So um, we've got a massive problem of disciple making in our, in our country, in our society. And we export our disciple making to the rest of the world. So it's really worldwide. It's all over. Now, one of the things this does, it doesn't allow a person to get content uh, by just going to Bible studies all their life. It's like, oh, no, that's not it. Uh, I, I've got to move on. I've got to be equipped. I've got to be sharing my faith. In Matthew 4.19, it's one of my favorite definitions of, of uh, a disciple. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, notice to, to Jesus, a disciple is someone who is following him, follow me, who is being transformed by him, I will make you, and who is on mission for him, fishers of men. And you could add to that, in the community of Jesus' followers. So we can't be content until people have gone from Matthew 4.19 to Matthew 28.20, 20, where it says, go into all the world. You who have begun to follow me, who are being transformed by me, who are on mission for me, you know, go into all the world and make disciples. Now you can, you know, the world can be more than just geographical, it can be vocational. God calls every one of us to little worlds uh, where, where we represent him and so forth. But all of us should be involved in that. We should never let anybody think that they've arrived simply because they go to Bible studies. Um, 
come be with me. It's all about being equipped. It's what leadership community is. It's an opportunity to, to learn and to grow and to learn. How do I do this? Um, but the people who do it find it's the most satisfying, the most joyful, the most you know, great experience of life itself. That's why Jesus said, I have food to eat that you know not of. Remember, they were all excited about the food. I'm normally in that group. Um, so, we inspire them in those first two weeks. We engage them with this four-chair assessment. Uh, it's bibli the four chairs are biblically rooted. It's actually, A.B. Bruce, who wrote the classic on this called The Training of the Twelve, uh, has a, a very similar kind of sequencing of this is how the disciples were, were trained and how he moved them along. And it was sensitive to where they were at different points. Um, And then the third part is going to be consulting. And this is where we're going to have some discipleship pathway guides, staff, elders, some ministry leaders. And uh, uh, so we're going to ask, if you would like to sit down with someone who kind of knows their way around New Community Church and kind of knows what's going on and what might be a good place for you, we, we will have a, a chart like this, which you will see in your uh, handouts. It's called the Discipleship um, uh, Personal discipleship plan, I think it's called. And uh, as you can see, it just shows you all the options, and it, and it does it by helping you see it according to the chairs. So, for instance, you know, we think, well, I need to send them to a study. Actually, the greatest thing in their life could be to help them to see how serving, being other-centered, self-giving, building a habit of that. I can, I can remember, you know, convening groups of guys who are all business owners and stuff like that. And I said, you know, your, your biggest problem is always going to be this. You're always given directions. You're always telling other people what to do. And there's nothing better you could do is to submit to somebody that you think doesn't, doesn't stack up to me. He's not as bright as me, but he's telling me what to do. And I'm going to serve, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I said, you'll grow more from that than you will from probably 100 Bible studies. Now, so this is going to help you. I won't go into it any further, but there'll, there'll be some training for those who go through this. It, it, it'll help you to, to, to broaden out your understanding of, oh, this is how people grow. I just need to be able to explain that and to show that to people. Now, actually, there's a whole book that you can get on this. So um, that's probably what I would, would want to say to you is if you get all in on this, um, I can pretty much guarantee you that at the end of the year, you're going to be in the top 10 to 15 percent of disciple makers in the country. Again, that's because we have midgets, you know, of whom I am one. But um, the, the more I get into it, the more you just see, oh my gosh, there is just so much here. So, um, uh, consulting will be, uh, you know, sitting down and just having a discussion with someone who knows kind of their way around the church. Uh, you know, I, I still find people who they go through discipleship essentials. And they don't know that there are other books in that library that have been developed over the, over the past years. And sometimes you just need a second, you know, um, a second study. And so to be able to go from one to another and to keep guys together for a long enough period till they get to stage, you know, chair three, in which they can actually uh, help other people. So um, let's, let's go then from that first series called Living Our Mission to the second series, which is going to be the integrated series. It's going to uh, kick off uh, the last week of September. It's going to go till about Thanksgiving. We're going to use the Gospel of Mark. Um, and it's not going to be a study of the Gospel of Mark per se, although we're going to go through it one chapter a week. Um, but we're going to look at it through the lens of discipleship. So we'll be looking for what are the lessons on discipleship that we learn about the message of the gospel, about the method of how Jesus trained people. Then we're going to take a break when we get to Thanksgiving through the holidays and through the first uh, uh, part of uh, January. And then we'll kick it in again. And then we'll go back and we'll do eight more sessions, which will take us from chapter 9 to 16. So there's 16 chapters in Mark. And, and chapter 8 is, is kind of the high point, the climax of it. So it's, it's a natural place to stop and take a break. Um, but by spreading it out that way, it'll give us a whole ministry year to kind of reflect upon discipleship, which, which I like a lot. Um, uh, it, you know the concept of an integrated series, I think, because all of you have been around when we've done them. It creates a, a lot of very positive energy in the life of the church. 
because everybody's on the same page. Everybody's, you know, kind of talking, you know, about the same thing. Um, so that's what will be going on Sunday mornings. But then it, in our groups, in our small groups, we're going to use that laminated card and the, the uh, Discovery uh, Bible group method. And uh, if you, how many of you have either attended uh, or been on one of those Zoom calls or watched the training thing on the website? All of you just about? Okay, great. Um, what I find is uh, people initially look at it and think this is kind of shallow and superficial and stuff like that. But once they actually begin to study it and to understand it and have some conversations around it, they begin to see the beauty of it. So I'll just punctuate it by, by, by saying this. What I, what I really like about it is you'll notice the DNA at the, under each one. So for instance, this card uses a little bit different language than the ABC, but it's exactly the same format. I mean, it's exactly the same, um, you know, flow of thought. And so you begin the, you begin the group, um, your group time by, by saying, okay, what's everybody grateful for today? You go around the circle and say, what are you grateful for? And then you say, okay, let's go around again. Say, what are you burdened by? What are you stressed out? You know, what's, you know, what are you down about? Everybody goes around and shares that. Then you intercede for each other. It's a very powerful moment I've noticed in the times that I've done this when people start praying for each other about very specific things they've just said. And what's happening is you flipped what normally happens at the end of the group when everybody's tired, ready to go home and thinking about other stuff, and you put it up at the front. So this is not only a discovery of the Bible, it's a discovery of community. And they begin to really uh, quickly bond is, is what happened. And um, uh, and you'll notice those DNA things are the actual attributes that you are cultivating. So in other words, if you do that every week for eight weeks, fall and then the spring semester, um, you know, it's, it's going to start moving you towards a habit of gratitude. That's, that's how people change. Uh, if you keep sharing your, your stressed out problems that you're dealing with, it's going to build into you um, you know, that DNA of compassion. You're going to start to get more sensitized to the issues and problems. I'm always shocked sometimes at the things people share. Uh, people I think I know pretty well and know what's going on in their life, and they share things, and I go, I had no idea. I had no idea. And then intercession, that's the third one. Well, you can go down and get the idea. But that's what I love about that, is that it's building habits into people. And it, it takes the pressure off you, because you don't have to have all the answers. You're just an doing questions. And once you've done it a couple of times, you could pick it up, you know, right then and do it. Now, I, I know there are some, you know, folks that just, they want to go deep and they want to get, you know, into it. So that's why we're giving you the gospel or the uh, commentary on Mark. So you can use that um, uh, for your own, and, but what I would do is be very careful that you don't start teaching or trying to you know, overwhelm the conversation with what you know. It, it, the value of it is when people actually begin to discover things on their own because you're asking questions and they're discovering it on their own. And so sometimes actually it happened in a staff thing, somebody asked a very direct question about what one, and I started, you know, and then I kind of <laughs> said, no, don't do that said, you know, go back and look at the context and ask yourself, what do you think it's mean, it means? Ask a couple other people. In other words, engage them in the discovery process, okay? So that's what's going to be going on in there. There is a workbook uh, that is available uh, that I don't have a copy of right here. Um, I, I would strongly encourage you to do the, the discovery Bible method, but if you want to look at it, we'll have them here in a, another week, and you'll be able to see them and kind of look at them. And if, and if you say, yeah, you know, we want we want to do this, that's okay. Um, we're not going to, you know, kind of legislate what you have to do, but we're going to show you what the options are and give you our recommendations on what I think we'll do, because it will build your skills in leading a discussion. Now, I want to say something else too about groups, because I know people are, you know concerned about COVID and is our group going to be able to meet and stuff like that. I, the, people are all over the board. I know groups that have been meeting um, and other groups that are planning to meet live, other groups that are going to do Zoom because of the concerns. The thing I like about this is it, it's, it's very adaptable. It's got all kinds of possibilities to it. So, you know, some groups were saying, you know what, we're, it's just, you know, we're, we're burned out. We're, you know, just over our heads. And so we're, we're just going to take off. Don't let them take it off. This is going to be too good of a, an opportunity to miss. So what I would encourage you to do is say, what you ought to think about doing is 
matching up with your spouse and doing it as a couple. Or do a hybrid in which, you know, say your group comes together and, and, and another challenge is going to be, we're going to ask you to meet every week for eight weeks. Now, I know the immediate thing is, oh, we can't do that. Our people won't do that. Yes, they will. Because you, if, if you do a good job of explaining it to them, they'll want to do it. And, and, and you can be very flexible in the way you, you approach it. So think of it this way. You're going to go eight weeks, then you're going to take eight weeks off. Then you're going to go back and do another eight weeks, and then you're going to take the rest of the year off. You're going to meet for 16 weeks <laughs> out of 52. But when you meet with that kind of frequency, it really does make a difference. And if you need to shake things up, you can do like three, one, one off. And on the off week, instead of getting in Zoom, you let people get together in quartets. You know, maybe two couples meet on the front porch and they go through the questions just like you go through a group. But you can mix those things up in different ways that keep it fresh. And remember, the key to renewal is what? New. So whenever you do new things, new curriculums, new methods, new, you know, new, new people in the group. In other words, if, if all of a sudden you started having people get together, just two people, one, even just one of the four times, um, it will do all kinds of positive things for your group. And if you, if you need some suggestions or want to talk those through, Vicki and I are glad to, to talk to you. But this has great opportunities. I would love to see 40, 50 you know, of, of these little micro groups of husband and wife, or two guys, two friends, you know, or three or four friends, just sitting on the porch, getting together in the backyard, socially distanced. Um, you could have actually a fantastic group experience doing that. So keep all the options in mind as, as we go through it. Yeah, let me just say a word about this. This is uh, based on something called social, uh, social theory, uh, social space theory, and the idea is that certain social spaces or groups of people lend themselves to certain things and not to others. So, for instance, when you have a hundred or more people, it lends it, it's a public space. It lends itself to public teaching, it lends itself to um, worship, it doesn't lend itself that well to getting to know names or needs or feeling connected in a personal way, okay? And the interesting thing about Jesus is he always moved people beyond the crowds. In fact, the crowds were not his number one priority. It's absolutely clear that Jesus spent more time in those, you know, uh, social, personal, and intimate spaces. Uh, Jesus in the 70, he sent them out two by two. Jesus in the 12, the 12 apostles. Uh, Jesus in the three, Peter, James, and John got special attention. They went on special field trips. Uh, with Jesus. And then the, the bottom one, the divine space, is Jesus and the Father. You know, very early in the morning, it says Jesus, you know, got up while it was still dark. He went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And this is all your, this is happening all the time. Jesus is withdrawing and actually getting away from the crowds, you know, resisting the lure of celebrity to work behind the scenes because he knew that that was the most effective thing he could do. Now, Mark asked me this question once when we were starting to go through some of this stuff. He said, so where would you put um, the uh, CLC on this? And it's, it's an interesting question because as you're aware, there's a lot of energy going on in CLC right now. And this becomes a, a perfect diagnostic tool to help you understand why. First of all, and I heard a guy give this uh, testimony the other night at a barbecue, but he said, he, he, he said, I, uh, you know, I got this invitation to go to a six o'clock men's meeting at the church. And, and, and his wife said, you don't have anything else going on at that time, do you? <laughs> and he'd been avoiding, you know, groups and stuff like that. But, you know, he didn't really have it, so he got into it. But it became a major catalyst in his own spiritual growth. Why? Because he stepped beyond the, you know, Sunday service and he got involved with a group of guys, and his life's not really been quite the same since. Now, uh, the first thing CLC does is they have an overnighter, which I find sort of funny because, you know, it's like eighth grade, right? Having overnighters <laughs> with guys, and, and uh, so they get together. But what happens is that magic of fellowship begins to take place. They begin to bond with each other. So by the second or third meeting, they've actually got relationships. They, they've actually got, you know, friendships started. Um, then, you know, there's a group of 12, so there, it's a personal space for the most part, but they do something other, very interesting. Once a month, they get together with one other guy, you see? So now they're moving into an intimate space. 
So they've got both going. They've got a personal space and intimate space. Um, they, they're, they're not only getting to know people by name and, under, and getting in touch with their needs, they're getting a sense of belonging, they're feeling part of a, something bigger than themselves. Um, in that intimate space, you know, what trans, that's the most transformative one, by the way, the intimate space. Um, and and it's, for, it's easy to figure out because transformation is the result of two things, truth and transparency, okay? Now, what, what's happening in that group is there's a high degree of transparency and there's a high degree of truth that's being, you know, pumped into it. And, there, and, 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 and if you think about the typical small group, when it's both genders, you're not going to have talk about your struggles in marriage. You're not going to talk about sexual issues. You're not going to talk about, you know, a number of things when you're in a mixed group. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you're, you, could, you could have picked a bad curriculum and there's not much truth to it, okay? But if you get truth and you get transparency, you're going to get transformation. And that happens. You, you can see how it's, it happens much more easily when you've got two men, Two women or three men, three women, like our triads and discipleship. Um, the, the, anybody that's experienced them will tell you the transparency level is much higher. You know, the truth is very good because it's an excellent curriculum. So, you know, you can you can take um, a tool like this and begin to evaluate your own group. I've had groups tell me once, you know, we've been meeting for three years and. You know, we, we still don't really, we haven't connected. And you ask, well, how, many, how often do you meet? Well, we meet, you know, like, you know, twice a month. Well, and how many people miss, you know, one, oh, you know, maybe a third of the group. So, in other words, you're telling me you, you meet one, you know, you, you maybe met six times in the, in the course of a, of a year or semester, and you're wondering why you didn't meet. There's, you know, good research-based stuff that will tell you. You have to have 20 meetings within a certain frame of time to bond with people. So, in other words, once you understand some of these underlying principles, oh, another one, this, this is a classic of uh, uh, CLC. Um, have you ever heard the acronym FIT, Frequency, Intensity, Time? Um, their frequency is every week, okay? And that's different than a lot of small groups. Uh, their intensity is much more because they require you to do work outside before you come to the group. Uh, a lot of groups, what do they do? They go to the lowest common denominator. Let's show a movie. Don't make me think. Don't make me do any outside work. I'm already busy. Okay? And you remember, every one of the guys that were in CLC, 30 some guys, everyone to the man will tell you, I did not have time to do this. And everyone will tell you to the man, this is the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> you know? So there's something about that, you know, when you, when you put some intensity into something, some frequency, in, and then time. You're, you're together for two years. So if you want to know why those guys are growing, you can go back to those simple principles and kind of figure it out. Truth, transparency, frequency, intensity, time, bonding, moving beyond the crowd to the, to the core. Any questions about that? that? I kind of went through that, blew through that quickly. But we're going to go th back and we're going to go through all these things in our uh, e-trainings during the year and dig down on them so you'll understand them. So just remember, this is the start of the conversation here. Okay, let's, let's go back to the triangle there. The Okay, personal devotions. You, you, want, you want to be aware of this. We're going to move from a, a psalm uh, morning devotional. If Mark starts off the series, uh, the last week of September, on what we're, what we're calling Discipleship Rediscovered, that Monday we would shift to two new books. And uh, one book is called Discipleship Gospel. We'll spend two weeks with that one. It'll be a little bit different. We'll probably find a quote or an idea that we like, just make some quick reflections on it and then pray, okay? But again, the key to this is the reinforcement and the repetition of ideas that happens from Sunday to small group to personal devotions. And we're then in the second book we're going to be using is called, believe it or not, How to Live in Love Like Jesus. It's a great book. It's uh, one of the best books I've ever come across on spiritual formation. I had the chance to actually uh, talk to the uh, author of it uh, this past, uh, last week. And, uh, uh, you know, a, a cohort of guys that I'm in, a bunch of ministry guys, uh, we spend three hours uh, once, a, once a month talking on the Zoom call. And uh, everybody went around and shared what that book had meant to them. And it was, it was amazing to hear these pastors talk about, you know, how deeply that book had moved them. And, uh, you know, I just think what, what a nice coincidence is that's actually the mission of our church. So they're nice, easy little chapters, but they're, they're incredibly rich and incredibly, um, 
you know, grounded in, in scripture. He's, he's a, actually, he just left being a pastor. He's going to be a full-time writer, the guy who did this. His name's Brandon Cook, so we call it the cookbook. <laughs> okay, so you see how that's going to fall out? Eight weeks in the fall, then another eight weeks in sp spring, winter, semester. Um, and then we'll, and then if you're augmenting that with your small group, uh, and, and it can be a lot of different kinds of experiences from husband and wife to, you know, a big Zoom call uh, to a hybrid, you know, all kinds of things work in this. And uh, then personal devotions, but the repetition of those ideas is a proven way. And if you've been through any of our other ones, I think the first one we did was the per, uh, Purpose Driven Life. And, and uh, I think that kind of sold us on it. In fact, I remember we had something like 450 people in small groups. And let me, let me uh, touch two more things, and then we'll just have some Q&A time. Jesus didn't make disciples this way. See Jesus there with the chalkboard, and then the two guys on the right writing notes to each other. Guy on the left making a paper airplane. The guy behind him, you know, looks like he's writing a letter to his girlfriend or something. <laughs> um, it's classic, but if you think about it, you know, this is a good illustration of the Jesus model of discipleship. In other words, Jesus didn't make disciples in classroom settings. He got involved in their lives. So the best thing that you can do, and the way you can apply that, is by getting involved in the lives of the people in your groups. The next slide is the deep dive conference, and that's a term that you might not know yet because we haven't told you. <laughs> but um, you remember we did this seminar called A Praying Life a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, uh, basically what we were doing was taking one of the steps from the discipleship pathway and saying we're going to do a deep dive. We're going to you know, bring in an outside speaker. Uh, we're going to do a Friday evening, Saturday morning, and really dig into it. And it was a uh, uh, fellow who had written a, a book, uh, Joel, if you remember the story, Joel was, every time I walked by his room, he would say, a praying life, a praying life. And finally, after about a year of that, he actually came and put the book on my, on my uh, desk. I ended up looking at it. It, it was a fa fantastic book. And uh, he had a whole group of trained pastors that went out and gave seminars. So that's what that was. That was a deep dive seminar. And the idea is that every year or two we would, you know, circle back and do take another step. So this year we're going to take the discipleship step. And we have a tremendous opportunity to host the National Discipleship Forum because of COVID. I went last year with 10, 10 11 guys from uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, it was a life-changing experience. Um, it's, it's called discipleship.org. That's the umbrella organization, but there are 23 different partner organizations inside of it, like Navigators, if you're familiar with them, they've been doing discipleship a long time. Sun Life, which is who does the um, uh, Urban Impact. Uh, they use a lot of their materials. Uh, Bonhoeffer Project, that's the cohort that I'm in, the Bonhoeffer Project, and that we get together. So all these 23 partner organizations are going to take part in this. There'll be 50 to 100 regional sites in which they're going to do a satellite. The Thursday will be the four, three or four main stage sessions, and then uh, Friday, whatever your partner organization, in our case it'll be the Bonhoeffer Project, will be their track of talks. So we'll have, I think, four talks from uh, that. I will guarantee you, if you go to that, you will know more than 90% of the people about discipleship. So it's a great opportunity. Oh, uh, I, I did want to say one other thing on e-trainings and um, websites. Um, I, I think I kind of mentioned it to you, but the uh, seven steps to creating a culture of uh, disciple-making culture. Uh, that's what's going to be the basis of our e-trainings this year. So each, you know, so, you know, the first month it would be define your destination. And then week two uh, would be uh, step, uh, move people beyond the Sunday crowd and so on. So each month we take one of those, we drill down on it. And the idea is just to keep that conversation going. Keep it in front of you so that at the end of the year you're really equipped and really uh, envisioned around uh, the whole idea of discipleship. Just a couple... Uh, uh, a couple things as, as we close, kind of maybe some takeaways or some, uh, some action steps. Um, number one, um, communicate or share your excitement uh, 
about any of these things with the people in your little circles of influence. One of the things we found is that, you know, there's so many moving pieces and parts to this, but when people get expo exposed to them, when s people got exposed to the uh, discipleship uh, or the discovery, d d discovery Bible method, you know, it just created a little surge of energy. People, some people, not everybody, but you know, a bunch of people got excited about it and started talking about it. Um, we, we, one of the secretaries read the book, Discipleship uh, Gospel, and said, that's the best book I've ever read in my life. Um, so you have these little pockets of people that are, you know, really excited and, uh, uh, you know, really enthusiastic and sharing it. So as you expose your thing, or if you, if you heard some things tonight that just get you excited, share those with others, because what that begins to do is to create a groundswell of excitement as people begin to look forward to this. And, that, and the second thing would be this, channel that energy. Um, there's a tendency uh, in, our, in our culture, and in, in lots of cultures, because it's the human condition, you know, uh, autonomy, uh, law to oneself. So we, we, we like to do our own thing and so forth. And sometimes before we even get the stuff out, people are like, you know, Marcus, they're, they're already planning different things because they're ahead of us. And uh, uh, here's what I want you to understand. Uh, we're never going to have an opportunity like this. If discipleship is the most important thing, according to Jesus, we're never going to have, well, we haven't up till now anyway. Maybe we will in the future. Up to now, we've never had an opportunity quite like this uh, to really dig into discipleship in the way that we are. So I would hate for someone to miss this. And I can guarantee you, they will, you know, if they go down another road, you know, and they'll look back and they'll go, oh, geez, you know, I wish I'd have, I wish I'd have done this. Um, there's a, a siloing effect in which people get in their silos and they're not talking. And this is getting exacerbated now because of COVID and people just aren't talking as much. And, uh, and so they, they, they start going down these roads and every, every week or two, we'll get a letter from some small group leader, somebody saying, oh, you know, we're not going to do the integrated series. We're going to do this, you know. And, and so I normally call them and say, <laughs> you, know, you know, let me explain to you why you're going to want to do this. Um, but understand, synergy comes from sin, uh, you know, the word synergies comes from sin, which means together in Latin, and energe, which means work. So work together. And my favorite theologian, Chuck uh, Noel, said this. He said, 11 men working together, synergy, uh, produce more than the independent efforts of 11 individuals. In other words, there's an exponential impact that begins to happen when we stop, you know, you know, operating out of our silos and begin kind of, you know, reading from, you know, the same hymnal, the same page, pulling in the same direction. There's an enormous amount of energy that begins to take place. And those of you that have been with us in the past, uh, when we've done these things, you know what I'm talking about. There is a, a certain excitement level that begins to take place. So I'd hate for anybody to miss that. So use your influence. That's part of what leadership community is about, is for you to get informed so that you can use your influence to help um, this talk about, you know, some of the, there's a lot of nuances to this stuff. There's a lot of subtleties. But if some of this stuff excites you, share it with people, because that will help as we get into this uh, next few weeks when we're going to start promoting it pretty heavily, okay? And that's why we tell you guys first. Okay, let me pray and uh, we'll close. Lord, we uh, just uh, pause and give you thanks for, uh, just for the privilege of being uh, your people, of loving us, of giving us the, the privilege of uh, serving in your kingdom and in the life of this church. And we uh, pray that as we uh, look forward to the fall, as we uh, just think about all the challenges that we have with uh, COVID-19 and, and what that brings to our small groups and to our church in terms of meeting, uh, that you would just give us uh, wisdom and creativity to just uh, see these as uh, opportunities brilliantly disguised as problems. And that uh, we would actually be able to look back uh, a year down the road and, and see all kinds of fruit uh, that have uh, resulted from uh, this focus on discipleship. You said that if you go, uh, that all authority in heaven has been given to you to go therefore and make disciples and that when we go out to do what you're doing in the world and what your, your priorities are, that you will be there and that your authority will back us up, uh, that you will go before us, come alongside us, that you will uh, anoint our efforts and uh, you will even use our mistakes uh, and weave them into good. So we just uh, give to you our plans. We make our plans, but uh, God directs our steps. So we, we uh, allow you, Lord, to uh, just uh, take this uh, as you will, but help us to do the best we can in planning and preparing. And uh, then we put it in your hands and ask you to do great things in this year ahead. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.